Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our panel. Um, we're still waiting for one of our speakers, but hopefully he's going to join uh, shortly. Um, so I'm Alexandra Fatal, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our panel on our changing needs for fulfillment. Individuals all have different abilities and needs. Many of the latter are underfulfilled. Um, and one impact of COVID-19 um, has been to shine a light on this. Lockdowns and social distancing have reduced interpersonal contact and increased feelings of isolation. For some, the lines between professional and private lives have become more blurred. We see into each other's homes. You're all now in my living room, even though we've never met. Um, companies which had previously resisted allowing employees to work from home have been forced to become more flexible and families have been forced to juggle work, childcare and teaching simultaneously. These changes have affected different people differently. Some have loved spending more time alone um, or with fewer people and working from home and others are itching to get back into the office. But the situation seems to have opened up conversations which were previously more taboo. Hello. Oh, hi, Simone. I'm sorry to joined us. Hi, um, hi. Nice to see you all. Uh, I, I'm, I've, I've started, so I'm just introducing the, uh, the panel um, okay. and giving a bit of a, of a, of a brief overview. So yeah. I think, um, and so we, could you just put yourself on mute um, so that we don't get any background? Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so I was saying that these, these changes um, that we've been going through because of, of the pandemic have affected people differently. Um, but that the situation has opened up conversations that, um, that were previously taboo. And, uh, and so companies um, are, are becoming more flexible. And, uh, and so we'll, um, sorry. The, so in, in, the title of our panel is Our Changing Needs for Fulfillment. Um, but have our needs changed? And if so, how? Or have our perceptions of them changed? Are we becoming more aware and accepting of them? And does this differ across cultures or between countries? What can we do to boost contentment, achieve inner peace, spiritual health, and overall balance? And what can our leaders, both political and in the business world, do to increase satisfaction for their citizens and employees now and in the future? So with me to discuss all this and more, uh, we have uh, Patricia Bonnard of Mixar, um, based in Italy, Simone Cipriani, founder of the ITC Ethical Fashion Ish Initiative in Switzerland, Vandana Harris, lawyer and investment and inclusion executive in the US, and Nalima Paraska, president and CEO of Snap IT Solutions, also in the US. So thank you all so much for being with me. Um, I'd like to start by asking you all to tell us briefly about your companies, organizations, and what your experience has been um, over recent months in relation to, to our topic. So, um, Patricia, your organization was set up in order to increase employee engagement within companies. Um, so tell us a bit about your experience. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Alexandra, for giving me the, the mic. And uh, I'm so pleased to be on this panel, and I think Fulfillment is indeed a, a very difficult topic to talk when uh, when when we are not in a, in a in an easy uh, way to get the fulfillment, at least not in the workplace. So um, what I'm doing at Mixer and what Mixer is is trying to uh, to do and and is having a very innovative approach to uh, tackle these problems of fulfillment in the workplace is um, well we have um, a, a technology software to uh, allow um, to find solutions in the workplace to um, to uh, to find solutions against the burning rate, the, the 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 turnover, the disengagement of employees, um, um, the burnout rates. I mean, all these very difficult um, numbers that are growing from day to day, and which costs, I think, only in the states, two and a half trillion dollars per year. And this number is going to increase in the, in the next months or years. And so what we do at Mixer is just skill trust so that everyone in the workplace can really find a way to belong to work, to the place where they are working. I think uh, psychological safety, um, in, you know, brings agility and can unleash potential and can unleash growth 
within uh, companies. And that's what really we focus on. So you were asking me what I did, you know, on the personal level as well. I think we all uh, were a little bit very, well surprised to uh, to face this pandemic uh, who came suddenly. And um, and if I can play a little bit on the word, you know, COVID, COVID, collaboration against um, this emptiness that we all feel inside of us. And I think if we could all unite and um, find a way to um, uh, to collaborate, recreate, recenter on what's really our true essence, find trust, trust in there so that we could all together um, uh, yeah, uh, fill in this void or this emptiness that we are all facing. And um, where we, what we try to do at Mixer and what surely I have been doing in my own family and on, also on a personal level was really telling everyone the only way out is go in. It's really refocus on the values we have and, uh, and what's making us so human and which is lacking right now. So that's how I would respond to your question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Simone, um, over to you. Tell us a, a bit about um, your uh, ITC Ethical Fashion Initiative and, and what your experience has been over the recent months. The Ethical Fashion Initiative is a program of the UN that gives work to a lot of people, especially women, who live in marginalized communities in the global south, especially in countries affected by war, conflict, or, or extreme poverty. So we work in many African countries, in Mali, in Burkina Faso, in Uganda, and Democratic Republic of Congo. We work in Afghanistan. We work in this, in this kind of, of setting. We give work to people by managing a large supply chain that enables these artisans to become permanently, permanently suppliers of, of, of big fashion brands. So we have a business model with social enterprises in the field that coordinate the work of the artisans, cooperatives and all the rest. So uh, this COVID is affecting, so fulfillment for us is fulfillment of one's own potential as an artisan and as a human being. By participating in this, in this network and this production network, people are enabled to really fulfill their potential because they develop new skills, they develop new social also abilities, they develop also the levels of income that allow them to change their position in society. And as the majority of these beneficiaries are women, this is extremely important also in terms of social capital. What, uh, so it's really the, the fulfillment of the, of the human, of the personal potential, potential of, the, of, each, of each person. And, and this COVID is, is disrupting this in two ways. On one side, it's reducing work because we have less orders and all the rest. But on the other side, it also reduces the social interaction, which is one of the foundations of our model. In our work, we work to regenerate the social capital of the societies where we work. Social capital is a function of collaboration, of bridging people, of having trust in other people. And this is extremely important in places where there is war, where there is a conflict, where there is extreme poverty. These societies are atomized. Uh, this, this kind of, of bridges of collaboration, of exchange are lacking. In our system, in our business and development model, people get together, they build trust with each other, they regenerate this capacity to work together and to think together about a shared future, a common future. COVID with social distancing and less work is also affecting this. So this is, this is the dimension in which we live, in which we, we operate, and this is, and we keep our work alive, and we have kept on working and producing. We, 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 we passed from producing all the things that we make, bags, accessories, garments, blah, 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 to making masks and other things, in order to keep the social dimension together and not to allow COVID to disrupt further this society, these social links. Okay, thank you so much, Simone. Um, 
Nandan, over to you. I know you've had quite a bit of change uh, this yes. year as well. <laughs> yes, I have. So um, I uh, had um, started 2020 um, even pre-COVID, although I'm sure we uh, people knew about it, um, uh, with a cancer diagnosis, which I wasn't expecting. Uh, I don't have a family history. Um, you know, I'm pretty up to date on uh, regular checkups. Um, and it's amazing that it's always interesting we talk about it today with the start of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, and so for me, I think I had that diagnosis. I had a change of jobs. Um, I am about to change countries. Um, so I think <laughs> I've, I, I've put everything into 2020, um, including uh, being an extrovert and having to learn myself how to be an introvert given the restrictions on, on social interaction. Um, so prior, I'd recently joined Simpson Thatcher's London Funds Group as a senior counsel. Um, uh, but prior to that and, and at the start of COVID and through my journey, uh, I headed up the investment team at Unreasonable Group, um, which is an impact focused company. And the idea is to uh, help growth stage companies who are making a difference, generally focused around the UN SDGs. And the way they do it is by inviting specific, uh, inviting and sourcing specific CEOs um, across the globe in conjunction with strategic partnerships. And the entire concept of that company was based on personal and in-personal, in-person uh, programs which suddenly were put in place. In fact, uh, we were all set to do a London program. Uh, the entrepreneurs were there. Some of the mentors, investors were on their way. And the day before it started, we had to close it down uh, because of the risk of COVID. So it's been a real transitional year. And I think the one takeaway I would take from it is uh, culturally growing up in Kenya, uh, being, um, you know, part Kenyan, my, my mom, Indian, um, the the we are focused culturally on other people and i think this year i had to really go inside kind of like what patricia was saying like look internally and almost be selfish uh for myself for the betterment of my health um and take control of my own body uh, because I had so many people from medical side, from the company having to make decisions, um, you know, just from home life having to make certain decisions. Uh, so it's been a really big learning curve for me. Um, it's been an amazing year for growth for myself, uh, but also a vulnerability. Um, I am completely fine. I was super lucky. I had a surgery uh, before the lockdown. And so with you know, if I compare myself to so many people and what they go through, uh, I got off very lightly. Um, and I learned a lot in that journey as well. Thank you so much. Um, Nalima, uh, over, over to you. Thank you so much for um, this opportunity to express and share. Um, I'm Nilima, as Alexandra mentioned, this year has been a very interesting year for Snap IT and me personally as well. Going into the fourth year um, of the company is we survived three years. Fourth year is a really crucial year to um, establish and scale. Um, so 2020 started off really amazing. Uh, I was at World Economic Forum um, speaking at Davos. Uh, meeting wonderful people, making big plans, come back home. Um, February, March, we were uh, signed up to open up a big space here in our city, about 10,000 square foot. Our entire team was looking forward to collaborating, expanding, and then suddenly everything stopped in all the tracks. See, uh, we had to lock down our off the new office, um, shut off everything. The main purpose of Snap IT has been to develop talent from underrepresented and underserved communities. We've been doing it from um, with our model. We call it a Snap IT Sprint model. It starts with training, custom trainings, um, working with workforce agencies. So we are uh, bringing in talent from areas that traditionally have been ignored. We train them 
hire them into our company, give them further more training by having them work on uh, technology products for small, medium businesses, low risk, uh, so that they can learn further. And then they go off into an accelerated mode. We put them in pods. So we have that Snap IT trains, Snap IT solves, and Snap IT pods. Via this process, we have trained, even this year through COVID year, we have trained 150 students so far, um, all in person, uh, either virtual in person or real in person, um, and then brought them into high tech jobs. 80 to 90, for 80 to 85 percent um, are definitely hired after these trainings as apprentices. Um, what happened when March, uh, the entire thing shut down is we had a group of um, apprentices that were in the pipeline to grow and incubate. And suddenly we're all sitting at home. It's virtual mode. Technology is so easy to use and we could pivot to technology, but nothing beats the personal, you know, mentoring and ha hand holding of our mentors with the mentees. And it's one of the toughest journeys that we have gone through. And I cannot be more proud of the team and our uh, our ability to pivot and really care for each other. If not for that, we would have not come through. The third quarter has been a blessing. <laughs> and now we are looking at an uphill on the fourth quarter. But I think what we did, the most that resonates through this process is we hold, holded our hands virtually with each other. We, all of us, not just me, that I was meeting with them every week. Here I am, you know, with all this craziness, but I did not make, I made sure the team was uh, addressed. But not only just me, but everybody else had daily meetings, understood each other, helped a mom with two kids who are at home from school. And it's beautiful stories. So I have hope. In this situation, we became stronger. Nothing can beat pre-COVID situation, but since we are already here, how do we actually listen and understand? So we've had that experience and I'm looking forward to 2021 um, because I think it is not only 2020 has taught all of us a lesson, a big lesson, but it also is a reset for what we have been doing. Because whatever we have been doing, we still have world problems, major world problems. So that means that this is an opportunity to reflect, rethink and reset of how we are doing what we are doing. And then this time when we come out, we actually can come out with a combined consensus because not one person is dominating. Now everybody has to listen. <laughs> so that's what I can say. Thank you very much. So, and going back to this idea of um, our changing needs for fulfillment, um, do, you, do you think that they are changing? And if so, how? Or do you think there's just more of a, a recognition of these needs, um, a, a greater awareness? Um, Simone, what, what do you think? And have you noticed any differences in co coping mechanisms in the different countries in which, in which you operate? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, more than changing needs, yeah, there are also some changing needs, but most of all, the basic needs, the need to be together, the need to have a job, the need to be healthy, uh, to be in good health, the basic needs are more important than ever. We had a bit, in the rich world, we had a bit forgotten uh, about the importance of them because we were accustomed to taking them, to take them for, for granted. Uh, and they are not granted anymore because you can get sick because you, you can lose your job because you are your social life is really disrupted in uh, the global south in the places where we work uh, people were aware of the, the the importance of them because it's a daily struggle but they also were on a path to secure them or in some places they had already secured them so losing them is even more excruciating for us in the, in the, in, 
let's call it the rich world or the affluent world. It's, it's, it's a shock because it's losing something that you take for granted. But for many more people, it's about losing something that you had struggled so much to acquire and the moment in which you acquire it, you lose it. So this poses a huge responsibility on leaders, on, on government, but also on business leaders. It's, it's the moment of changing the business model, um, but we'll speak about this later, maybe. Otherwise, I get out of, of, of your questions. Sorry, I stop. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Vandana, what's, um, what's your view? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Simone. I think what, what COVID showed us that it, there is, it has no ability to discriminate, right? It, it just, it takes over the world. Um, but the, I think the more important lesson is the fact that the gaps in our society, the holes, uh, the discrimination in terms of, um, uh, money, uh, status, health, care, etc. who gets what, the haves and the haves not, um, really came to surface. And I think that when you're stuck in your daily routine, things are moving very well. You know, um, the economies generally, in particular, the developed economies were, were, were booming. They were holding each other up. Um, and this hits and you realize that we have just band-aided all the issues one on top of the other. You know, um, add to COVID year, of course, in the US, we saw um, the racial discrimination come to light and the world got to see, I think, what so many Americans had suffered um, at the hands of, of government and discrimination, racial inequality, uh, systemic racism for so many years. Um, and then you see starts cracking across the world around there. So, so I, with what Nalima said is, you know, hopefully we learn, hopefully we step forward and go back because at the, at the core of all this, we are all human. And if we cannot hold each other up, if we cannot support each other, um, then what we've just gone through as a global, um, uh, group will be worthless. We uh, will have taken no lessons. We'll go back into the system that we were, maybe even worse. Um, and I think this is definitely a reset. Um, it's also an understanding, I think, when, so this happened when we were at Unreasonable. I was part of the senior leadership team there. And the, we had to, you know, within days, we were a global team anyway. We were sort of pods, not really remote and make decisions about, you know, uh, giving people the time that they needed. The mental health of people was so important. Suddenly you have children at home or elderly parents or, you know, things that are so out of your daily routine and system. Um, to, so we gave people the time off to, to cope with that. Uh, we instituted uh, no working hours. So you could, you know, if you had to work in, all night because you have to do other things during the day, that was okay. Um, we also instituted deep dive Wednesdays, which was, uh, no internal emails, no internal calls, anything you focused on what you needed, if that was work, if that was your personal health, your mental health. Um, so we did that. And then for every the first Friday of every month, we instituted a Thrive Friday, which was basically a day off. If you wanted to work, work, but you weren't allowed to contact each other for work. So there was no slacking and no email and no communication, no Zoom calls. Um, and I think it brought up conversations that were generally taboo in the workplace. And that is about our own mental health and the importance of social interaction for pe some people, but the, in the importance of space for others. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good point. Thank you. Um, and uh, Nalima? Yes, um, totally agree with Vandana's uh, perspective and Simone's perspective. I w also want to add that um, what Vandana touched about Black Lives Matter, it really hit home hard for our company as well because we are majority of minority. Um, and it was a lot of... Um, turmoil in mental health um, challenges and how to deal with something like that. And we are a younger crowd. Um, so not only did we put programs in place, like Vandana is talking about, we had rooms 
uh, virtual rooms where people could share more of their personal information, uh, personal um, areas of interest, whether it is gardening, cooking, other things that we usually don't bring into professional circles. But we are right now, it's we're all stuck at home doing really, you know, not really so, uh, socializing with our regular social circle. So we became a little more closer, I would say. But I also want to emphasize about the aspects of how can a leader and leadership, we call it accountability team, make a difference in how we promote? How can we give each other a break? And how can we understand and put ourselves in each other's shoes? Personally, COVID really gave me a balance of mind and my more time with my family. In some ways, I was really glad. Not that I will be after a year or so with that situation. I had more family time and I was glad about it. And small things like having a backyard helps. So you're not feeling like you, you're you going into a different spaces. But for people who didn't have it, we had options for them to think about a new home and company would support some of the expenses. We brought in mental health um, you know, advisors and holistic living uh, uh, con- consultants into the company where they could talk one-on-one or in a team setting. So all those really made a difference, I think, um, in the situation. So there is definitely, it's it's a not a good situation for many, but we can think about positive um, aspects of this. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask you, well, what, what do you say to people who say, you know, fulfillment and contentment and balance are all quite fluffy concepts, right? And, um, you know, a bit, a bit to Simone's point of, you know, this is a first world problem and uh, it's all too airy fairy. Um, you know, one, what, what do you say to that? And the sort of flip side is if we say, well, no, it's important, do we need to measure it in order to be able to, uh, you know, figure out whether it, whether we're helping or not, um, and and if so, how how do we do that? Um, so, Simone, over to you. It's yeah, but it, it's true. It's a f- first world problem, but I see it as a global problem because, as also my, my fellow speakers has pointed out, have pointed out, uh, it's a problem of really of social capital. These. Uh, uh, this um, uh, hitting the inner dimension of people, uh, hitting safety, security, hitting health, uh, social relationships, and all the rest, all together, all together, uh, uh, creates a status of anxiety that has a disruptive effect on societies. As you both rightly said, uh, it, it has immediately exposed how discriminated black Americans are and how disenfranchised they are also in politics, in the electoral process, in everything. And it did the same, this COVID, on, on, every, on every society. In places in the global south where societies are even weaker, where these discriminations are even bigger and where there is widespread violence, this increased those phenomena. Now there's a, a process which is called the peace process in Afghanistan, which is not really a, a peace process. It's, it's a process of, of dialogue in between the Taliban and the government because uh, the, 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 the United States of America has taken a decision, a strategic decision to withdraw the troops and all the rest. But this process of dialogue is happening at the expenses of women. Uh, l- l- women we, which have joined society after the end of the Taliban rule and which have become public servant managers and so on, which we, who have a right to education and so on, risk in places controlled by, by, by this group to, to lose everything. So the social disruption of now is also compounded by all these ongoing phenomena in Mali, where I work, another place where I work, uh, the, uh, just a couple of months ago, there was a coup d'état. Uh, this uh, this is, has been welcomed. 
welcomed by society, large parts of society, because of many reasons, but also because of the fact that society, the basic linkages among people in society are disrupted. So in uh, the most affluent world, discriminations, which are always present in every place, and in some places more than in others, discriminations have become blatant, visible. Uh, social conflict arising from this discrimination has become huge. And this kind of social conflict may be positive because it may fight these discriminations and eliminate them. But where there is no democratic mechanism to uh, flow, to, to, to accompany this social conflict towards some uh, shared solution, uh, this becomes becomes destructive. So even even all this meaning of words, contentment, fulfillment, these are philosophical words that have a very important impact on society, on our daily life. It's COVID is also a memento for us that philosophy is an important dimension of life. I remember people saying years ago, with philosophy you do not eat, but with philo without philosophy you do not live. So it's important to keep all these inner dimensions present to us and invest in them. One, one very final point, and I excuse myself, it's not the moment of business as usual. Uh, big companies, big corporations have a duty along with governments. It's not the moment of CEO compensation of shareholders' wealth and all the rest. The, the indicators, EPS and so on, they are going to, to worsen. Uh, the, 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 it's not the moment to pay dividends, to do stock repurchase, blah, 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 blah. It's the moment to invest in the supply chain and to keep the supply chains together. Because without this, we really disrupt society. And this disruption of now has the, cap the capacity to really threat what we know as society today, even in the so-called first world. And we are seeing this around. Eh? We see sovereignism coming back. We see these demagogues coming back. All these people are back also, and, and they are strengthened by this situation of uncertainty and fear caused by COVID. So inner self and inner realization is important even for that. Thank you very much, Simone. Uh, Patricia, I'm so sorry, you disappeared from my screen, and so I thought uh, you weren't there, but can Thank you? you. Yeah, yes, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm still there. Um, I'm uh, I, I would bounce back on, on your previous question, which I, I really wanted to uh, respond, but first to uh, all what Simone just said, because uh, I strongly believe that there is a lack of philosophy in everything that we are doing right now. And you were saying, you know, we, we don't eat with philosophy, but we need the philosophy. We need philosophers to make us think and to make us... Um, be conscious about the decisions, the, the business decisions, the political decisions that everyone is taking. So, Simone, thank you very much for bringing this up because I think this is essential and it's not said enough in, in, in any area. So, but going back on, on, you know, the change, uh, Alexander, that, that you were, you were asking us to, um, to respond to, um, I, I would like to say something about the world in which we are going, which is a contactless world with, with this COVID situation. And, uh, and I would make a, dif um, a, a difference or, or at least to, to put some nuances between untacked, so versus contact, so untacked and untacked. And, and I think the whole business world and the focus is now going into technology to reduce, um, the connection between people. And to use technology as, uh, um, uh, to, for brands, to market, to whatever. So we are really, uh, reducing, um, people, I mean, person to person connection and, um, and, and face to face online is not a real connection as, as such as it's not a, a hug and, 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 um, uh, and, and a natural way of, uh, of behaving. So this creates a lot of tensions. Um, between me and us, you know, between my, my safety, um, uh, the, the um, uh, my physical risk, my psychological comfort. And, uh, and, and this is not new. It has been created since many years through a desynchronized communication. 
So, and with desynchronized communication, I'm just pointing out, you know, that millennials, they, they can, they cannot have a normal conversation, a real one where, where we have really a debate. They would send a text and then you can read the text and respond a little bit later. And, and if you have, um, uh, teenagers at home, I, I think you will all relate to that. Or if you are surrounded by millennials, uh, you, you will relate to, to that too. And I think that th there, there is a danger there because we don't live in the now and we don't live in, in, in something that is uh, an opportunity for collaboration, for co-creation, because we are, we, we are, we are completely desynchronized. So, um, so that's, that's what I would like to point out. And, uh, and, and when you were asking in the beginning, so what, what are you saying? Um, well, I think that there is a need for, um, conscious, uh, leadership, conscious leadership, inspirational leadership, um, trust. And, and I think in, in the beginning, you, you were all talking about trust. I, I'm, um, Simona, you've been mentioning trust many times. And Vanana and, and, uh, and Ilima, you've been talking about trust and, and, you know, the health system and your company and, you know, the projects you are bringing, uh, the companies you are serving or, or what you are believing. And, and I think the, the trust and the hope, I think there are key elements to, um, to respond to this contactless world in which we will be forced to live. Thank you so much. Um, Vandana, uh, over, over to you. What, what, what do you say to people who say it's too airy fairy and, and how do we measure this? Yeah, um, it's, look, I think that uh, I am all for airy fairy. Um, and I think that the, the, from a, from a leadership perspective, uh, leaders who have acknowledged that the employees and who, you know, the people who work with them and for them, are the shoulders that they ride on versus employees riding on, on their shoulders are the leaders who are going to be really uh, respected, but also prosperous. And I just don't mean by money in terms of what they can bring to the table. Part of that, acknowledging that is the vulnerability, is acknowledging that we as human, whether we go to work or we are at home, have personal um, needs, you know, philosophy is, I, I think, a super important part of it. But there are cultures, and in particular, you know, when when we talk about the global South Simone, they have so many other things that we forget about the core and the need for these airy fairy conversations. You know, you're trying to put food on the table, so are you going to worry about where your next meal is coming from, or are you going to worry about actually I need 30 minutes to myself just so I can breathe? So I think so, so many of us have the privilege, have the benefit of being able to do that. But there is an entire world and a population probably larger than the, the haves um, that doesn't even have that privilege. And I think it has to become part of a conversation from a government end, end a leadership end. Um, and and it, it's the way philosophy will unite us as opposed to destroy us. I think, you know, measurement and policies and implementations and et cetera will divide us because not every culture will benefit from whatever the, the rule is or not. Um, so I, th I think it's super important. I think the other thing is, as leaders, and, and in many cultures, I think this is just, I'm not sure if it's seen as a weakness or it's just not part of a system, is the importance of asking for help. The importance, like I think Nalima said about asking the, your team, what do they need? You know, what are they lacking? Um, the, the importance of finding, you know, executive coaches. I mean, for me, the one turning point this year is to find was, was an, an executive coach that I searched for for about a year, but got um, Amy Elizabeth, who, you know, who, who looked at me more holistically than just what my resume was, you know, and, and tapped into the power inside me because I had a voice that so many people didn't have. I have a platform and stuff. And, and when we can each of us raise those, uh, we can talk about mental health. We can talk about vulnerability from the top down. We can accept that there are human needs as well as business needs. Um, I think as a society, we will do better. Um, and, and just empathy. I, I think as we lost in the last 10 years, for sure, this concept of empathy, 
um, you know, in all that sort of happened, if you look about right, the world and things. And I think as a society, we need to bring empathy back. Thank you very much, Nadina. Um, over to you. Well, to answer your question on measuring fulfillment, it's almost like measuring success or me measuring happiness. It's completely inward, more than outside, I think. Um, and to to um, to analyze my fulfillment, um, you know, aspects of it or my team's fulfillment, um, we recently had um, a survey for a, a, a particular uh, activity, and I saw all those comments that my team has provided about 120, 130 comments came through. It showed that what my, in my mind, what I think I'm trying to do to my employees is one thing. And in their mind, what I am or my team is doing to the, uh, to, you, to make a, the situation better for them is kind of different. Just spending that time made a difference for them. Right. In our mind, we are saying, how do we make sure they are financially, uh, um, you know, uh, there and give uh, promotions, give uh, bonuses. And, you know, it's not the same thing sometimes. Right. And that's the beautiful part about having and listening and understanding if you are trying to measure others fulfillment. If you're trying to measure your fulfillment, I would say your expectations and your fulfillment are the things that you, you, if you lower your expectations in turbulence times, your fulfillment will increase. Unless you're, you're at the same expectations that you should perform or you should have that happiness of going around and having networking and spending time. If you have the same expectations, then you won't fulfill, be fulfilled. Understanding what your expectations are given the situation and understanding how you're listening to others expectations i think is how we can measure fulfillment um if at all we can <laughs> i want to leave the time for you to talk before the great thank you very much um so we are uh, reaching the end of our session i wanted to get in one quick um last question um which if you can all be super brief uh, would be really appreciated but and some of you have touched on this already but what what is um a really concrete measure that you've put in place either for yourself personally or that you've put in place for your organization, for your employees, or that someone else has put in place for your organization um, that, that has really boosted your contentment um, in, in recent months. So Patricia, over to you. So um, in Mixer, what we do, we create um, uh, communities around shared interests. And so these communities are um, is, is, is a group of people within the workspace. And so uh, someone would moderate that or someone would be in charge of leading the group and leading the conversations. So if you see that this group is growing, that a lot of things are happening, then you know that, that everyone who is in this group are feeling quite happy and fulfilled in the, at least in the conversations that are led and, and the response they are getting to their needs. So I think that is something that we can measure very practically and, uh, and efficiently. Great, thank you very much. Simone, what's Mamma mia, I had no mic. If we have a social impact assessment in place uh, wherever we work and this assesses the impact quantitative but also qualitative of the work that we do on the mind of people, on, on the life of people. So one thing is to see, to keep on working and sending work and not disrupting things in order to see the levels of, of satisfaction not to decrease, not to decrease too much. In, in, the, in, the, in the team, we have a very large team that, that works in many different countries. It's about sharing this impact assessment, the impact of what we do, can do even in these difficult situations with the team to motivate the team because motivation, inner motivation is extremely important. And when people see that they do good with their work, they even they're able even to endure more difficult situations and of course to support people in, in their daily needs and if they have a relative of somebody in the family with COVID, which happened if they have a loss and so on. And in my personal thing, to keep this alive and to keep this going and, and delivering to our constituency, to our 
people to our beneficiaries in uh, in in the global south and in it at home the only the, the very positive thing is that i used to travel nine months per year and and for the first time in my life i've been for a long while with the family and this is very fulfilling excellent thank you i'm really sorry um we're gonna have to to cut it there i know vanda you were mentioning um that you introduced uh, thrive fridays and you were seeing an executive coach and lima you mentioned um that we need to all listen to each other more and that's something that leaders can do generally um in all in all spheres of life um i want to thank you all uh so very much for this very interesting discussion um thank you all for being here thank you to all our our panelists and our guests and to her assistants for inviting me and um uh, i wish you all a very fulfilling rest of your day all the best thank you thank you so much alexandra i appreciate it thank you very much for the time it's been thank a hope very much yes thank let's you. stay in touch Definitely. yes please, please 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 indeed thank you indeed. and dio stay safe stay safe ciao ciao Ich bin gerade sehr sicher.